Oral questions. Questions orales. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the wage subsidy was supposed to help workers stay employed. It was supposed to help small businesses keep their doors open. Instead, we've learned that it went to padding the bottom lines of 68 of Canada's largest corporations. How much money did this government spend subsidizing corporations that didn't lose a penny during COVID-19? Hey, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, I will get to the question in a moment, but allow me to begin by thanking the doctors, the researchers, the scientists at Health Canada and elsewhere who worked tirelessly over the past many weeks and months uh, to approve uh, the first COVID-19 vaccine safe and effective for use for Canadians today. Uh, this is a big deal, Mr. Speaker. It is a good news day for Canadians. Uh, we will see 30,000 vaccines begin to arrive next week, with many more on the horizon. But we are not through this yet. We've got a tough winter to get through, and I know we're going to be able to get through it together. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the vaccine is great news. I agree with the Prime Minister, and I appreciate him voting for our motion to have a plan so that Canadians can see that. I want to add to his thanks the Canadian Armed Forces, who helped our long-term care. We learned recently that Extendicare received $82 million from the wage subsidy at a time the Canadian Armed Forces took over their facility in Toronto, meaning Canadians were actually paying shareholders while the Canadian Armed Forces were cleaning up the corporate mess. Why did the Prime Minister pay millions for a job that the Canadian Armed Forces ended up doing? Uh, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning of this pandemic, we made a promise to Canadians that we would have their backs. And that's exactly what we did. We delivered on a CERB uh, that helped Canadians with replacements for their paychecks. We delivered on a wage subsidy that supported businesses small and larger to be able to get through these difficult times. And Canadians pulled together. Uh, we've continued to be there with PPE and now with vaccines, with rapid testing and with other things that have worked directly with the province is we will continue to support Canadians as necessary so we can get through this pandemic. I'm Chef the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Clearly put conditions on companies when it comes to dividends and share repurchasing in exchange for loans. Spain and the Netherlands built restrictions into their wage subsidy program. Once again, the government couldn't be bothered to do basic due diligence. Will the Prime Minister commit to reforming the Canadian emergency wage subsidy that it only benefits those in the break room as opposed to the corporate executives in the boardroom? Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, while Conservatives are talking about limiting and being careful and uh, holding back on spending and criticizing us for having gotten money out too quickly to too many Canadians, we knew that during these unprecedented times, we needed to get uh, money into the pockets of Canadians, into the bank accounts of small businesses as quickly as possible. And as we've said, we are verifying things on the back end. We're making sure that people didn't take advantage of it. But people who made good faith mistakes, Mr. Speaker, will not be penalized. Our focus during this year has been to be there for Canadians, and that's what we've done. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. But the Prime Minister is penalizing average Canadians and helping major corporations. The government changed the criteria for the CERB so that people who took home more than $5,000 before taxes are now being assessed on their net income instead of their gross income. The website mentioned nothing about net, Mr. Speaker. Even after the changes, it still doesn't. Why is there one set of rules for Canadians working hard and struggling in the unemployment line and another set of rules for connected corporate liberal insiders? The Honourable Prime Minister. From the very beginning, we were clear on getting support out to Canadians. The rules did not change, but we've indicated to Canadians that we will uh, work with them if people made good faith mistakes. We know that during this unprecedented time, we needed to be there for Canadians, and that is the choice we made. Now, the Conservatives have said we shouldn't have delivered as much money to Canadians as we did, but I know there's a lot of Canadians who look back on this year and understand that because we were all there for each other, it it was a much less bad 2020. We're not going to call it a good 2020, but a less bad 2020 than it otherwise would have been. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, 
we're living in a country where privacy protection is a fundamental right. Young people today are victims of traffickers. They're vulnerable. Those people are disclosing content without consent. C-11 could be amended to protect personal information. Is the Liberal government prepared to protect these vulnerable people in our society? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been working tirelessly to protect vulnerable Canadians, and that includes online activities. We're going to move forward with regulation that will ensure that online platforms withdraw or remove all illegal content, whether it's hate speech or exploitation of minors or any other violence or terrorist, terrorist activity. And we will give our authorities the tools they need to protect the most vulnerable. Belloy Chambly. The Honourable Member for Belloy Chambly. That's quite a welcome. Mr. Speaker, in an unprecedented and historic uh, act, six uh, premiers of Quebec wrote a short and clear letter calling for the Charter of the French Language to apply to federally regulated businesses. They're joining with the unanimous voice of the National Assembly of Canada and the Bloc, and we're not so sure about the member for Montreal, but uh, will the Prime Minister support and vote for the Bloc's legislation? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. In both, our both, our two official languages are at the very foundation of our country. We will always de defend the uniqueness of the French fact in Quebec and all across the country. We will defend both official languages for those living in minority language situations. And we have tabled legislation to protect uh, languages on the web, and we will strengthen the Official Languages Act. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Quebecers and all their former premiers know how they want to protect French. On another matter, the Prime Minister will be meeting the, with the premiers. Is he going to go into that meeting with an attitude of confrontation and interference, or will he present a proposal that might meet the Premier's demands uh, without any interference or strings attached, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Bloc Québécois is always trying to pick a fight, but we have been getting along very well with the Premiers for months. We've transferred resources to them to the tune of billions for health care. We've provided them with PPE, rapid testing, and now vaccines, we will be there to work with the premiers and the provinces to protect the health of all Canadians, and we will keep doing that. Be south. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government gave a billion dollars to big business, and those companies gave five billion dollars to their shareholders. But the Liberals don't want to penalize those companies. The people they do want to penalize are the workers and artists who applied in good faith for benefits. Why are the Liberals protecting the ultra-rich and penalizing workers and artists? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've been there since the very outset to help Canadians who lost their job because of COVID-19 with the CERB, with the wage subsidy for small businesses, we were there to help people through the very hard times of this pandemic, and we will stay there. We will keep supporting companies and workers, our seniors, our young people. We know that the pandemic is not over, even though vaccines will begin arriving next week. We need to stand up together to get through this summer, this winter, rather. Government are literally going after self-employed and artists. They're literally doing that right now. This government spent a billion dollars on companies that turned around and gave $5 billion in dividends to their shareholders. Yeah. 
Two of those were long-term care homes, which had some of the worst conditions for residents and seniors. Why didn't the Liberal government make sure that all public money was going to protect vulnerable seniors and residents of those long-term care homes? Yeah. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. President, le député. Mr. Speaker, the member referred to artists, and yes, indeed, as a government, we have acknowledged how hard our artists and creators have been hit by this pandemic with a lack of audiences to share their work with, their art with, and that is why, in addition to the CERB, we've provided hundreds of millions of dollars in additional support for them, and we will remain there throughout this pandemic so that we can all celebrate together at the end of the pandemic. I have no doubt that the reports of young girls being abused and those acts being recorded and then viewed millions of times online disturbs all of us. When I read about it last weekend, I was shocked and frankly, I was disgusted that it was happening right here out of Canada. I think all of us were. The Prime Minister was informed of this last March, and I'm wondering if he can tell us why he didn't, at that point, begin the process of stopping these images from being portrayed and viewed all around the world. I'm wondering why he didn't start doing something back in March. Mr. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been working for many years to fight child exploitation and uh, uh, abuse, and that's why we continue today actively working to create new regulations to require online platforms to eliminate illegal content, including hate speech, child, and sex child sexual exploitation, and violent or extremist content. Our approach will ensure that illegal content is removed quickly, that platforms are monitored, and that victims have access to a fast, transparent, and independent process. We're working with our international partners as well, and we intend to introduce these regulations at the earliest opportunity. Well, member for Portage Liscar. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're hearing that these porn sites themselves are going to start verifying uh, the, uh, the content, but I don't think any of us have any faith in these porn sites. Their goal is to make money, clearly not protect women and girls. None of us want this abuse to continue. We all have sisters and daughters. The government has said that they're going to introduce legislation next year, but I'm asking the Prime Minister, is there something that he can do today to protect our nation's daughters, to do something for them, not next year, not in a few months, but today, to stop this online abuse from happening and happening right here in Canada. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past years, we have stepped up on our fight as a government against uh, abuse, against uh, gender-based violence, against exploitation of minors. We've continued to put forward measures that protect all Canadians, uh, particularly women and girls, and we will continue to do that. Working uh, with the uh, Ministry of Women and Gender Equality, uh, we've put forward many programs to support, and as the member opposite says, there is much more to do, and we look forward to getting the support of all parties in this House as we move forward forward on strengthening measures to protect all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Shakutami Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic has shown that the provinces have substantial health demands. They need more resources. The Prime Minister will be meeting with the Premiers tomorrow to talk about health transfers. Is he prepared to do like our leader and commit to providing stable, predictable and unconditional funding for our provincial partners. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, since the very beginning of the pandemic, we have been there with the provinces and territories to protect Canadians, to invest in the health care system. From the very beginning, we transferred half a billion dollars more, including to record transfers this year and later, with the safe restart, we added another half billion. In total, Mr. Speaker, that's $25 billion that we've transferred to the provinces, in addition to rapid testing and PPE, and now in addition to vaccines. The Honourable Member for Shakutami Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, in his last economic update, the Prime Minister tried to throw the provinces a bone by announcing $1 billion for long-term care facilities. $1 billion with a whole bunch of unacceptable strings attached. That is purely and simply federal interference. The provinces can manage their own funds. Has the Prime Minister lost confidence in the provinces? 
And is he unable to commit to stable, predictable, and unconditional transfers? The Right Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the lives of our seniors and their dignity has no jurisdiction. It's also part of the federal government's responsibility to protect our seniors all across the country. We are working with the provinces in partnership with the partnerships in, with the provinces, rather, to deliver a better health care system to Canadians. And those systems will protect, protect Canadians better, unfortunately, than we've been able to with this pandemic. All Canadians expect all seniors to be protected wherever they live across the country, and we will be there to work with the provinces on this. Gary. Mr. Speaker, five years ago in counting, the Prime Minister promised to end the blood ban against gay and bisexual men. All parties are united in ending this outdated stigma now, not in months or years. More than ever, safe blood donations are needed urgently. The Canadian Medical Association and the All Blood is Equal campaign have the science-based safe solution that simply changes a questionnaire to ask about sexual behaviour, not sexual orientation. Will the Prime Minister finally keep his promise and put an immediate end to this discrimination? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we got elected in 2015, we made the commitment to end uh, the MSM blood ban, and we are working forward towards that. Uh, we dropped the, uh, the, uh, the, pre uh, the uh, ban from five years to one year and further dropped it to three months, but we needed to do that based on science. Unfortunately, under the Harper government, uh, the blood services were starved of the m research money necessary to do the work, and therefore we funded them to do the scientific research necessary to be able to eliminate that blood ban altogether. That is our goal, and that is what we are going to do. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my friend and colleague had a very reasonable question on the discriminatory blood ban against members of the LGBTQ community. The Prime Minister has made this promise several times over the last few years, but like many things, there's never action. There is science and there are several other countries following this procedure and ending discriminatory bans now. Will the Prime Minister answer with a serious question, with a timeline, to live up to the promise he made five years ago? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in 2016, the deferral period was reduced from five years to one year. In 2019, it was further reduced to three months. We have funded 15 projects to find the evidence necessary to eliminate it altogether. We will continue to work with Canadian Blood Services and IMUC Quebec uh, until we cross this finish line, which is in sight. But I'm very pleased to see members opposite standing up for the rights of the LGBT2 community. I just wish they would talk to their members who continue to stand in favour of the barbaric conversion Therapy. It would be nice to see the Conservative Party stand with the LGBT community for once. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, Pierre Marc Johnson, Daniel Johnson, Lucien Bouchard, Jean Charest, Pauline Marois, and Philippe Couillard. The only female Premier and all living Premiers in Quebec history have joined with the National Assembly in calling for the Charter of the French Language to apply to federally regulated businesses in Quebec. The Bloc Québécois has tabled legislation to that effect. Will the Prime Minister heed the call of all Quebec Premiers and commit to supporting our bill? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're waiting to see the bill that the Quebec government is going to table at the appropriate time, and we will work with them to protect the French language. That is a priority to the Liberal Party of Canada and always has been. We announced in the throne speech that we would be there, not just in the same way that we've always been, to protect Francophone minorities all across the country, which the Bloc can't do, but also to protect the French language within Quebec. And we will be there wholeheartedly to ensure that our beautiful French language is protected. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Blah, 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 blah. Empty rhetoric. For 13 years, the Bloc has been calling for Bill 101 to cover federally regulated companies. Surely the Prime Minister's had time enough to make up his mind by now. Today, all the Premiers in the history of Quebec are calling for this to happen. 
and all of Quebec's labor unions have climbed on the bandwagon. The unanimous National Assembly, the House of Commons, everyone's calling on the Prime Minister to take action. Will he extend Bill 101 to federally regulated companies, yes or no? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, blah, 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 that's all the bloc can do, Mr. Speaker. We are here to, to act to protect the French language, and we will always be there. We have committed to choosing only judges for the Supreme Court who can speak French, something the Conservatives have not even committed to doing. We will continue to defend the French language and work together with the government of Quebec when they table their legislation. We're looking forward to seeing it, and we will work together to meet this challenge of the decline of French in Quebec. Monsieur le Président, la Mr. Speaker, the House passed a motion calling on the government to make a decision on Huawei by Friday, December 18th. The motion isn't binding at law, but it is binding in a moral sense. Will the Prime Minister respect Parliament's will, and will he make a decision on Huawei by next Friday? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, 5G technology will meet an explosion in demand for faster and, and higher, higher speed and higher capacity networks, and Canadians look forward to taking advantage of the latest innovations of 5G technology. But security will always be our top priority, and we will never compromise on matters of national security. We are continuing to make sure that our Canadian networks are safe and secure, and we will continue to work with our experts in order to move forward appropriately. It's not about how great 5G is. It's about respecting democratic norms. This Prime Minister talks a good game about respecting democratic norms abroad. He has said, quote, Canada recognizes the critical need to strengthen democratic norms in institutions around the world. The PM talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk here at home. He fails to uphold democratic norms here at home. He has ignored the call by this House to list the IRGC yep. as a terrorist group. Is he also going to ignore the call by this House to make a decision on Huawei by next week, Friday? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, particularly in this time of pandemic when everyone is turning towards digital and online activities as uh, essential for staying connected, we will continue to ensure that we're listening to the best advice of our scientists and experts and national security advisors uh, in terms of making the right decision to keep Canadians safe while giving them access to the full range of digital opportunities. That is what Canadians expect of us. That's what they expect of all of us in this House. We look forward to working together to ensure that that happens. Well, member for Wellington Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, first we were going to have a decision on Huawei before the election. Then we weren't. Then we were going to have a new framework on China. Then we weren't. All the while, Canada's national security is being threatened, and Canadians are being harassed and intimidated by China's foreign influence operations here on Canadian soil. When will this government get its act together on China, respect the will of this House, and come forward with a robust plan to counter China's foreign influence operations here on Canadian soil? Well, hey, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past two years, two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, have been detained arbitrarily by China, uh, and Canada has done absolutely everything necessary to try and get them home safely. We will continue to hold up uh, our principles, our values and the rule of law as we defend Canadian rights, as we uh, push back against China's coercive... What's the problem? Is it with the interpretation? Okay. Hello. So... Can I ask, uh, is it working now? Interpretations functioning? L'interpretation. Is the interpretation working now? Okay. Okay. The right honorable prime minister had finished, so the honorable leader of the opposition. The regime is abusing our citizens, abusing our security, abusing human rights, abusing 
the rules-based trade order. This week, the European Union passed their Magnitsky Act. This week, the United States added 14 more Chinese officials to their sanction list for the creation of a police state in Hong Kong where 300,000 Canadians live. That brings 29 officials to the list sanctioned by the U.S. The number for this Prime Minister is zero. When will the Prime Minister finally show a serious and principled approach with respect to Communist China at home and abroad? Good Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the course of the last two years, we have worked tirelessly with allies and partners around the world uh, on uh, holding China to account for the arbitrary detention of two Canadian citizens. Uh, we have pushed hard and we've seen allies in every corner of this planet uh, speak up in the defence not just of Canadians, but of the fundamental rule of law that protects us all around this world. We are going to continue to work closely uh, with our allies, particularly uh, in the Five Eyes, uh, to push back against China's coercive diplomacy uh, in a way that benefits Canadians, that upholds our values, and uh, protects the opportunities we have around the world. Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, Canadians who followed the rules and applied for CERB in good faith are now getting repayment demands from the government. My constituent Carol is self-employed and made less than $10,000 last year, but the government says her net income was barely too low, so now she owes them $14,000. Meanwhile, the Liberals are letting at least 68 large companies who got millions in government aid pay out that money as dividends to shareholders. So why do the Liberals always help the rich but keep Canadians like Carol in poverty? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, we knew in this pandemic we needed to support Canadians, and that's exactly what we did. We uh, rolled out in record time supports to Canadians across the country uh, with the CERB, with the wage subsidy, with supports for seniors, for youth, for families. We're going to continue to be there to support Canadians. Now, uh, during that time, there are people who may have made uh, good faith errors. They will not be penalized for that. We needed to make sure we would have Canadians' backs, and every step of the way, we've been there for them. Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Mr. Speaker, currently there's a proposal at the WTO to waive intellectual property provisions that could frustrate the COVID-19 vaccine rollout across the world, and Canada has so far stood against that proposal. Instead of helping big pharmaceutical companies protect their bottom line, the government should be putting the needs of people first. We need to do everything we can to ensure the safe, timely, and affordable delivery of as much vaccine as possible. The WTO TRIPS Council meeting is tomorrow. Will the Prime Minister commit to finally supporting the waiver to ensure people and not profits are the focal point of decisions around vaccine production and distribution? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, we knew that you cannot end this pandemic anywhere without ending it everywhere, which is why even as we were securing a larger range of potential vaccines than any other country, even as we were securing more doses per capita for Canadians than for any other country, and even as we are now seeing vaccines roll out to Canadians as early as next week, we've not forgotten our obligations to the international community, which is why we've stepped up with the COVAX facility, with the ACT Accelerator, with measures that will ensure that as vaccines become available, they become available to the most vulnerable around the world as well. We need to vaccinate billions in the coming years. We will help. The Honourable Member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The opposition has said Canada is at the back of the line for vaccines. And a member of the party opposite is even sponsoring a petition questioning the safety and the effectiveness of vaccines. And the leader of the opposition refuses to denounce his comments. Earlier this morning, they were proven wrong. Can the Prime Minister please update the House on the government's plan to get Canadians a vaccine for COVID-19? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank the member for Newmarket Aurora. Mr. Speaker, we reached a critical milestone in our fight against COVID-19 today. Health Canada approved the first vaccine for COVID-19. Regulators worked around the clock to complete a thorough independent review. This vaccine is safe and effective. We will have 249,000 doses by the end of the month. An initial shipment of 30,000 doses will depart for Canada this week, arriving at the 14 shipment points across the country as early as Monday. We're working with and thank the Canadian Armed Forces uh, who are ready to ensure Canadians get vaccinated as soon as possible. 
the Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Mr. Speaker, on June 30th, Air Canada cancelled 30 regional routes with no follow-up plan from this government. On October 14th, WestJet cancelled another five routes regional routes with no follow-up from this government. Yesterday, Air Canada cancelled another five regional routes with no follow-up plan from this government. Mr. Speaker, these routes are important not only for the communities, for the aviation workers, but for Canadians who rely on their services. When will this Prime Minister deliver on his promise to restore Canada's regional routes? Great Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, air sector workers are hit hard by this crisis, and we continue to support them with our programs. We're very concerned about Air Canada's decision to suspend ad additional regional routes in the Atlantic. As we are developing a package of assistance for the Canadian airlines industry, I can assure Canadians that before we spend one penny of taxpayer money on airlines, we will ensure that regional communities retain air connections to the rest of Canada and that Canadians get their refunds. We know that this is not a time for travelling right now, Mr. Speaker, but when we get to start travelling again, uh, we know uh, that our air carriers need to be there for all regions of this country. Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Yesterday we learned flights to airports in St. John, Sydney, Fredericton, Charlottetown, Deer Lake and Halifax have been reduced or cut entirely. For months, the Transportation Minister has said a plan is coming. Today, the Prime Minister says he's concerned. That's not good enough. We're nine months into this pandemic and air travel is going the wrong direction. My constituents in southwest New Brunswick, which now has zero service out of St. John, as well as thousands of others in Atlantic Canada, want to know what the Liberals are going to do to keep airline travel running down east. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, given this pandemic, there are not a lot of Canadians travelling uh, in the Atlantic bubble or elsewhere across the country. And airlines uh, have made decisions that are, are concerning not just for now, but for the future as well. We are ensuring and working with them to ensure that regional routes uh, are uh, restored as soon as necessary, as soon as possible. And indeed, we will not be supporting uh, the airlines with sector-specific support uh, until uh, they are assuring us uh, return of regional routes and uh, return uh, the, the uh, refunds to Canadians. For Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nicola. Mr. Speaker, yesterday residents of the South Okanagan were shocked to find out that Air Canada is cancelling all flights to the Penticton Airport. Those that rely on this airport do not have access to a government jet like the Health Minister, and they certainly don't have the luxury of waiting for months as this government dithers and delays. Mr. Speaker, will this Prime Minister do something now, or is he telling the residents of the area that they should go fly a kite, because they certainly won't be flying? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have worked with sectors uh, hard hit by this pandemic from the very beginning, uh, including over a billion dollars to airline workers across the industries to support uh, the important air travel that it will be necessary once this pandemic is over. We have expressed over ma the past many months our concern about suspension of regional routes and will continue to work uh, with airlines to ensure uh, support and protection of regional routes, particularly once we get through this pandemic and want to start traveling again again. But as I said, no sector-specific support will go to the airlines uh, until they return refunds to Canadians and until they show us a plan for restoring regional routes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister Mackenzie King once said Canada is a nation with too much geography. This Prime Minister seems to agree, and he's failing regional markets from the Okanagan in BC to Atlantic Canada. The government has failed to roll out a rapid testing strategy at airports that would allow some of these regional routes to remain open. The federal government is responsible for the certainty of air travel that binds this country, Mr. Speaker. How many Canadians are going to be stranded on the tarmac waiting for this government to act? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we hear the Leader of the Official Opposition going on about rapid testing. When the fact is, he's been talking about it all fall, when over two months ago, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, uh, support, we sent rapid tests to the provinces in the millions. In regards uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the travel, uh, we have, uh, over the past many weeks, run a pilot project with our friends in the Government of Alberta to ensure that we can see the impact on rapid testing 
testing on quarantine times and drawing from the data that we get from that, we will make further decisions about how to best keep Canadians safe as they seek to travel once again. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, Quebec has just recorded 1,728 new COVID cases. Healthcare workers are already overwhelmed and soon we'll be asking them to do even more because they will also have to be managing the vaccines too. It's healthcare personnel on the front lines fighting this crisis, and it's also them who will get us out of this crisis too with vaccines. We have to support them, not turn our backs on them. Will the Prime Minister join Quebec and the other provinces to announce an increase in health transfers in a significant and lasting way? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're in the midst of an unprecedented crisis right now, and during this crisis, we have been there at every step for Canadians and for health care services. We were there with historic transfers of several billions of dollars, and we were there for PPEs and for quick testing, and now we are there to help with vaccines. Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to sitting down with the Premiers tomorrow to discuss everything we're doing together to protect Canadians now and looking to the future as well. The Honourable Member from Montcalm. Health care transfers need to be greater. All the provincial premiers will be meeting with the prime minister tomorrow to ask for an increase in health transfers. They had to cancel Christmas. They had to shut down thousands of companies. They had to announce to millions of people that they would be losing their jobs. They had to cancel operations and, and stop cancer screening. These are unprecedented measures because this is an unprecedented crisis. Will the prime minister take this into account and finally increase health transfers in a lasting and significant way, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to correct my honourable colleague. This year we transferred tens of billions of dollars additionally for the health care system in partnership with the provinces. And next year we are going to be transferring another $42 billion extra for health care systems. But in this crisis, we have gone beyond what has ever been done in the past to help provinces to ensure the safety and health of all Canadians. And we will always be there to ensure the health and safety of Canadians. That's what Canadians expect of their federal government, and that's what we're going to continue to do. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthur Beska. See former Quebec premiers of all political stripes support the National Assembly statement saying that 101, Bill 101 should be applying to federal jurisdictions, com companies under a federal jurisdictions in Quebec. Even unions are asking for this. All the opposition parties agree with this request in this House. We're just missing one person to be in support of it, and he he's in front of us now. How come the Prime Minister does not support the request of all former premiers of Quebec and all the people I've just mentioned. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, as I said, Mr. Speaker, we're waiting for the provincial government in place now to table legislation on this. We're going to look at this and we're always going to work with them to protect the French language like we've always done as a party. But I don't have any lessons to learn from the Conservatives because could they commit today to for example, appointing bilingual judges to the Supreme Court. How come they refuse to do this? Are they going to rise to talk about this now? Or perhaps they could commit to only speaking French, uh, uh, appointing French-speaking judges to the Supreme Court like we did. The Honourable, it's incredible to hear this Prime Minister who's not able to, well, in, in addition to the director of the party in Quebec and almost all the members who are speaking against Bill 101 right now, we learned that the formal Liberal member sent a letter to the media saying that he's also against federal companies under federal jurisdiction be, being subject to Bill 101. The Prime Minister should say clearly in this House that he agrees that companies under federal jurisdiction in Quebec should be subject to Bill 101. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, as, I've, as I predicted, Mr. Speaker, they're saying nothing about the fact that we think that Supreme Court judges should all be able to speak French. 
the conservatives are not there to protect the French language. They're there to pay petty politics. We are there to pr protect the French fact across Canada, including in Quebec, and we're going to continue to work to defend minorities and the beautiful French language across our country. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Six former Quebec premiers signed a statement showing their support to Bill 101. People from different political backgrounds, and they are on the same page. Mr. Speaker, it's rare that Mr. Charest and Mr. Bouchard agree on something, and that is the position of our party as well. What is this Liberal gov government waiting for to allow for an extension of Bill 101 to bring federal, uh, federal companies under federal jurisdiction? We're waiting for legislation from the current government of Quebec. But once again, I've just given them three opportunities to pronounce their opinion on Supreme Court judges. They refuse to commit to appoint only French-speaking justices to the Supreme Court of Canada. We, you want to see what they think about the French fact in Canada and bilingualism? Well, there's an example. The Liberal Party will always be f defending the French language. Cumberland Colchester. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I first bring warm regards from Nova Scotia. And I want to congratulate the Prime Minister on Canada's first vaccine approval announced today. So while this is very good news, rapid testing is also very important to stop the spread of COVID-19. And I know my constituents here in Cumberland Colchester would very much appreciate hearing about the availability of testing upon possible exposure. So could the Prime Minister please give us an update with regards to to ensuring Canadians have access to rapid testing. Thank you. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Cumberland Colchester for the question and for ex her exemplary leadership during this extremely difficult year. Testing is one of the most important tools we have to respond to COVID-19. We've already authorized six rapid test response kits to date and deployed over 8.1 million of them to provinces and territories. To ensure that these tests are put to best use, PHAC also released guidance for provinces and territories on best practices. Have there been, we've been there for the provinces and territories every step of the way, and we'll continue to support them in delivering on their responsibilities for health care. Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, municipalities across Northern Ontario have been waiting over 100 days to find out whether they will receive funding through the Community Investment Initiative to support economic development. The department claims to respond to funding applications within 80 days, so I raised this issue to the minister two weeks ago, but as of this morning, we are still waiting for an answer. So can the Prime Minister tell us when these municipalities can expect to have a clear answer on the status of their funding applica applications? Prime Minister. Over the past many months, we have worked to flow unprecedented funds to provinces, to municipalities, to communities and organizations that have needed extra support because of this terrible 2020. Uh, the COVID crisis has caused us all to need to pull together and work together, and we have been there for municipalities, for Indigenous communities, for rural and remote areas, for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. We will continue to work with them to ensure their applications get processed as quickly as possible possible for any further help that they might need. We will be there for Canadians. That's a promise we've made. That's a promise we've kept. Honourable Member for Kenora. Well, Mr. Speaker, that was a classic non-answer from this Prime Minister. I asked a question about the Community Investment Initiative through FENNOR. The Prime Minister didn't answer, uh, didn't respond with using the words FENNOR, the Community Investment Initiative, Economic Development, or, the, uh, or Northern Ontario, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. So I will give him the opportunity to answer the question again. When will Northern Ontario municipalities expect to have a clear answer on the status of their funding applications? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think if the member opposite checks the blues, he will see that I actually said that the applications are being looked at as uh, rapidly as possible, and we will work with them uh, for any extra funds that they need. Uh, in the meantime, speaking of regional development agencies, I was extremely pleased to highlight that in the fall economic statement, we recognize the need for a specific regional development agency for British Columbia. Now, uh, in addition to the tremendous amount of support we give through Western diversification, we will be able to give more support 
support, uh, in addition to that, directly to BC to ensure that regional development agencies have the tools to best support people on the ground right across the country. This is a good day for regional development across the country and will continue to be. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, our economic recovery has to be about how we create jobs and in the process get our resources to market. The proposed Alberta to Alaska rail link can play a vital role in increasing market access for Canadian resources and creating jobs in Yukon and across the Northwest. Indigenous leaders are championing this project, but we can't get a straight answer out of this government. So, Mr. Speaker, is this government going to support the Alberta to Alaska rail link? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we receive a detailed project, we will uh, look at that project. That is how these things work. We no longer in a time where someone can simply shrug and decide, I'm going to throw a railroad across the country and then get it done. We instead are going to work with, uh, with, work with interested groups, work with promon- proponents of the project, and make sure uh, that it is done the right way. Conservatives might try to take shortcuts all the time. We are focused on getting things done right so they don't end up in the court uh, years down the road. We believe in developing the economy of this country the right way in partnership with Indigenous people, in partnership with environmental concerns. That's exactly what we will do. The Honourable Member for Marc Aurel Fortin. Mr. Speaker, throughout the pandemic, our government has done an outstanding job of ensuring that Canadians have access to essential personal protective equipment. We saw at the beginning of the pandemic that it was very difficult to ensure that we received N95 masks, face shields, gowns, and other PPE that met the standards. There were supply chain issues and an unprecedented level of demand as the entire world sought this equipment. Can the Prime Minister give us an update on the PPE that we brought into Canada and sent to our provinces and territories? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I'd like to thank the member for his question and for his hard work. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had to face many challenges to acquire PPE. And we rose to the challenge by negotiating contracts for the purchase of more than 187 million N95 respirators, uh, face shields, millions of facial uh, surgical masks, and deliveries continue to arrive every day. We promise to protect the health of Canadians, and that's exactly what we're doing. For Churchill Kiwatanek Aski. Mr. Speaker, no community has been harder hit in Canada by COVID-19 than Shamatawa First Nation. 291 confirmed and many more potential cases, an 80% test positivity rate. I reached out to the ministers again yesterday. I appreciate a reconnaissance mission is heading in today. But this nightmare scenario is getting worse by the hour. And this is happening in Canada, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So will the Prime Minister do whatever it takes to save the lives of the people of Shamatawa First Nation? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of the pandemic, we said we'd always be there to help those in need, and that's exactly what we're doing. The Minister of Indigenous Services confirmed support for the, from the Canadian Rangers to Chief Redhead of Shamatawa this weekend. We've heard the call for more support, and an evacuation of vulnerable community members has already begun, with efforts underway to increase the isolation capacity within the community. We will be there for them. And speaking of being there for them, because this is the last question, allow me, Mr. Speaker, to thank all the Pages, all the Kaus of Stalman's common staff, uh, and everyone who've been there for us through this very difficult year. And to you and your colleagues, Mr. Speaker, thank you all for an extraordinarily difficult but successful year in this House of Commons.